I work with, uh, with uh, Eric here from my team. Um, we're based out of California. Uh, we're part of the developer strategy team at Oculus. Uh, so basically, our main goal is to be able to get, make you guys successful as content creators. Uh, basically, we have one-to-one -one relationships, and we work together with developers and content creators on all stages of development to sort of like be able to set you up for success. So to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today, one of the questions that we get asked all the time is, what do I need to build in VR? What, what genre should I pick? What, what direction should I go in? You know, what, what kind of game do I need to make? And what I would say to that is, the main focus of what you want to create should take into account presence. Presence is what makes VR magical. It's, it's the most important thing. And what we're going to talk about and what I'm going to show you today is seven different developers, seven different successful titles on our platform. And we're going to take a, a bit of a deep dive into the decisions that they made to be able to bring presence to their titles. Uh, and these were decisions that they had to make along the way and they had to make them from the moment that they were thinking about what kind of game they were going to make. So they had these in mind from the very beginning. And uh, let's start off with a small game called Arizona Sunshine by the team over at Vertigo Games. Uh, they wanted to make you feel like you were really sort of saving or trying to get back to humanity, really, by going through this horde of, of undead folks. Uh, and they had a couple of decisions that they had to make, right? As opposed to a traditional shooter where we're all used to the WASD and sort of like your 1 to 12 and your F1 and, and so on and so forth, they had to find a way to make you feel like you were embodying this character, like you were part of this world. And it was really important for them to, for example, keep your keep your eyesight, your HUD clean. Because right now in real life, as I'm looking at all of you, None of you have things stuck to your face, right? So one of our sayings is you, you want things fixed and not stuck on your face. So we don't want to headlock things on people's faces unless it's meant to be in-world, unless you're meant to be some astronaut where you, the expectation is you will have a helmet on your head. But at the same time, they had to find ways to show you what your remaining health was, you know, ammo. Uh, so some of the, the decisions that they had to make was how do, how do we show you your health? And how do we do it without the traditional health bar? So they came up with a really interesting uh, sort of gesture-based, let's look at our watch uh, way that was, it was easy enough for the player to be able to see how much health they had left, but still it felt intuitive and didn't take away, again, from the sense of presence. And one of the other things that you're going to see a lot today is uh, shorter hands. Uh, so hands don't have to be very long. Uh, I believe we all know that the longer you want to make it, the harder it is for it to, main, to remain loyal to what the user is really expecting. So we found that short hands can feel really good um, and not take away from the main experience, but still give you the magic of your hands in VR. And then one other thing that they had to do was they had to come up with a way to show, sort of show you how much ammo you had left. So they actually have you look down at your waist at a belt that you have um, again, still make it readily available for you to take a look at whenever you need it, but never really obstructing your experience and your view uh, of what the real world feels like or, or would feel like to you. In this case, uh, one other thing that they did that was really smart was, uh, and we see this a lot, was they had to come up with a way to show you that you were taking damage. And one thing we've noticed is no one right now is actually forcing you to close your eyes. So if you actually close, if, if you close the player's eyes for them, that can feel really uncomfortable really quickly. But they still had to show some way uh, of telling you that, hey, if you don't do something, you're going to die. So they were able to sort of like show you through the edges of the screen by sort of dimming uh, and coloring the view a little bit so that they were able to sort of like get the message across. So these were all decisions that they made that never really got in the, that never really took you out of the experience. That's what you don't want to do. And the moment that you headlock something to someone's face, you're sort of pulling them out. So, so they had to make a lot of decisions along the way that I feel all served the, the purpose of presence. Another title uh, here from the team over at Shell, I Expect You to Die, their mission was to make you feel like a top secret agent. So they had to make a couple decisions along the way, some of them being 
Well, you, object manipulation. So you will have to sort of work with objects in a way that you necessarily wouldn't in real life, but still make it feel like it was within the world and not taking you out of it. So one other quick call out here is they also went for the shorthand um, instead of the long one, which works really well. And when it came to deciding uh, sort of what to focus your attention on and how to manipulate with objects, they were able to figure out a way to do it so that you could uh, still feel awesome when you did it. It, still felt, it was still a gesture-based system, and it still felt really good, and it didn't take you out of the world. And they did a really good job with that. And it was quite ingenious at the time, because in, in a title like this, you do have to interact with multiple objects at a time. One other thing that they did really well was, you see that lighter there, the expectation in real life is you would actually flick that lighter. So when you give people the, when, when you take the time and actually have that lighter flick open that way, it feels really good. And that was a, just a couple of the decisions that they made that worked really well. Then uh, moving on to a title by Soulfar Studios called In Death. In this game, you're sort of like in a purgatory state. So the team over at Soulfar wanted to create an experience that felt, um, that, that felt unique uh, and that had a lot of replayability to it. So these are actually procedurally generated levels that were a really ingenious way to sort of encourage players to come back and play more. Uh, we get asked a lot of the time, you know, how do we keep players uh, invested over time? So I think they, they did a really good job by combining procedurally generated levels along with uh, a series of achievements that you can get uh, that speak a lot to me as a competitive player. Uh, so you will find me repeating that level over and over again until I get those achievements. One of the other things they had to figure out was a tutorial system that still felt, again, serving the purpose of presence, still felt in-world. So what they ended up doing was, and this is another tip that I will give everybody when it comes to VR, is there is no headlock text in this image. What they actually did was they overlaid the text on the real world. And that works really well because while in real life we're still not at that level, uh, it still sort of conveys the message, again, but without headlocking to your face. So it's a really clever way of, again, just speaking to uh, the site of presence. And then one other thing that they were able to do that worked really well was they had to figure out a way to show you how much health you have. In the case of Arizona, we saw that they did the watch. In the case of Sulfar, what they did, which was super clever, was they actually built the health into the weapon that, that you're wielding. So whenever you found yourself having to shoot a target, or in this case, I was trying to get away from a number of targets, I would naturally sort of find myself seeing my health as part of the action of actually putting the bow up and, and putting it in place. And when it came to taking damage itself, they were able to also do a sort of system where they dim the screen a little bit, but they didn't force your eyes closed. So I thought that was super clever. Another title called, uh, this one's called Eleven by the team over at For Fun Labs. By the way, this is a, a very small team. It's less than five people. And they were able to deliver um, a really compelling uh, physics-based uh, title. In the case of Eleven, they wanted to, again, play to the replayability factor. Um, in this case, they, being a small team, they sort of had to make some concessions along the way. So what they ended up doing, because this is a multiplayer experience, what they ended up doing was they actually rendered just the headset. Uh, they didn't do full avatars, but it was still enough to be able to convey the emotion uh, because you could still see the, like, the sort of the bobs of the head, you could see people's hands, so it just goes to show how you can still convey emotion even in a limited, even with, you know, something as limited as not having a full avatar, which was something very clever on their part. The other thing that they did here that works really well for them and also keeps players coming back again and again was they also created systems that allowed players to sort of customize their own experience. In this case, you could actually set up uh, sort of a bot on the other side to, to shoot different spheres at you. And you could make that be as, as unforgiving as you wanted. And at the same time, they were able to sort of deliver different environments within their limited budget. So they wanted you to feel like you were going to different places. So in this case, they did this main studio loft, but they also did one where to the side, you could sort of see snow and ice and mountains, and it's the same table and it's the same, you know, 
player on the other side, but you still feel like you're going somewhere else. And that's something that works really well in VR. You want, it, you want people to feel like they're going to different places. Uh, and that's part of the magic of it. And at the same time, they were also able to deliver multiple different modes for you to be able to play with, which worked really well. There's another title here called Orbis VR, which you might have heard of. Uh, it's sort of the first real take on an MMORPG, which speaks really close to me and to my heart because I've been playing MMOs for 15 years. So when I first saw this, I figured, well, will they be able to nail it? Will they be able to give me that feeling that I had when I you know, played a, an MMORPG for the first time? And they did a really good job with it. This is actually mainly a two-person team that's been able to do this. And today, they, they've, got, they've got a lot of players that are deeply engaged and that are spending hundreds of hours in this title. What the team over at Orbis Online was able to do really well was to give you what you expected out of an MMORPG and take it to another level. So today, for example, for me, being a, I'm a healer main, so usually my cast is just a combination of key-bound buttons uh, that you know, I'm just clicking and, and clicking away at. But in the case of, of Orbis, they wanted to find a way to sort of make it, take it to the next level. And again, presence and making it feel really good. So in Orbis, as a mage, you actually have to draw the spells yourself. Not only that, there's a system that checks to make sure that you cast the spell in exactly the right format. And some of the spells you have to memorize. And not only that, when it comes to combat, you have to nail them every single time and you have to get them right. So here I, I almost got killed uh, because I was having trouble casting Fireball 2. One thing they were able to do really well, again, and, and I just want to keep sing signaling these out, damage, being taking damage, again, no forcing your eyes closed. They were able to sort of dim the sides to just convey it in, in a way that was clear enough to me. And if you take a look right over here, again, they were also using health on the weapon itself. So again, just re right available there whenever you're casting, but never really stuck in your face or taking away from the experience itself. One other thing they did really well, and I, I can't stress this enough, gestures in VR are a lot of fun. Like things like, and, and this is something they did, for example, they would have several items that were your most used items actually on your body itself. So if you needed to draw your weapon, you could just reach back with a gesture and, and summon it. Or if you needed your pickaxe, you could actually grab it from the side and just go and pick at whatever you needed, whatever material you needed at the time. And then when it came to inventory management, which on MMOs is probably the hardest uh, and what we always complain about, there's never enough inventory. They were able to do a gesture-based system where you would actually move your hand in, in this way, this fashion, to sort of summon the menu. And it, would, it was actually overlaid in the real world, which felt really good and made you feel awesome. And again, it was away from your face. So you felt in complete control and it wasn't taking you away from the world. So you're still there on the, out in the middle of the world you see people just walking around, going about their business, and you can just take a moment and, well, you want to be careful, you don't want to aggro, but you can take a moment to put your equipment on and off. So that was another really clever way that the Orbis team was able to give MMO players what they wanted without taking away from the magic of presence. And then one other thing that they did really well was when it comes to VR, you want the world to feel alive. So one of the best moments that I had when I first played Orbis was I'm just sitting there practicing, this is Fireball 2, I'm practicing Fireball 2, and then all of a sudden I, I hear something and I see this ship just flying over my head. And the feeling that I got was, was, was pretty magical. And it made me feel like I was part of a world that, you know, that, was, that was alive, that was brimming. And there were a lot of other folks in here that I didn't capture, but they really did a good job of sort of putting you, putting you out there and making you feel like you were part of something special and something big. And me just talking to folks around, uh, there are people that, that have been able to form meaningful relationships in here, and they all spoke about you know, how memorable the experience was. And some of them, I think the, the, one, the highest one had about two or 300 hours in the game. So this just goes to show that you know, making the right decisions, even being a very small team, you can deliver something that is compelling, that's magical, that will keep people coming back again and again. Then moving on to the team over at Against Gravity, they built an experience called Rec Room, which you might have heard of. 
uh, it's a big social space where they wanted players to feel welcome. So what they ended up doing was when you first land in, you actually see you land into a dorm room itself. And they were able to sort of convey a lot of information by actually having you land into a physical lobby where you could find everything you needed and it was right at your, at your disposal. So that was very clever of them. They also did uh, a menu that was overlaid over the real world. So this one you would actually, they also had a watch. So you would just summon the watch and you would actually physically click on it and summon the menu. And one other fun thing in VR that you can't do enough of is our buttons. Like actually have people physically push buttons, that feels really good. Or actually flick switches. Like opening doors, it feels great in VR. <laughs> as boring as it is in the real world. So, and so you can't give, so those are like little things that, you know, things that don't mean a lot in the real world that all of a sudden in VR you're like, oh my God, I opened a door and it feels great. So those you can always do, you can't do enough of. Like for example, right here, if you wanted to go do laser tag, you actually have to go over to the door and actually, you know, open those doors to go through. So decisions like that, things like that all serve the purpose of actually making you feel like I'm in this gym right now and that's a girl over there and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go play laser tag with a big group of folks. When it came to conveying emotions, they came up with another smart system where if you wanted to quickly show someone how you were feeling, they actually had you sort of like do a gesture with touch and then, and then move your hand in the direction that you wanted to do and release. And that would actually either send the, the little love smileys or in this case, if you were feeling, feeling a little sad. And another thing they did that was, was really, that really helped people feel like they could create unique identities was they gave folks a lot of customization options. So you were able to, as soon as you came in, sort of choose your outfit for the day. One other thing they did that was really smart was they always had a lot of information to convey to folks, so they wanted to tell people about what was next. They actually physically created a bulletin board within the room to show you what was coming. So again, just really creative ways of conveying big amounts of information in a way that was always available to players, but never actually in their face or taking them away and breaking presence. And then last, uh, we, can't, we can't leave this one out, Super Hot by the Super Hot team. So in the case of Super Hot, which I'm sure you all know really well, uh, they wanted you to feel awesome. They wanted you to feel badass. You were part of this program. You had to be committed. So one of my favorite things that they did was they actually have you physically put a headset on whenever you're going to your next mission. And when it comes to actually running programs, they have you physically grab this floppy disk and insert it into the computer. When it comes to uh, making you feel visceral, feel joyful in the case if you survive through this, they actually have you like move your body around the space. And you can never do enough of that and that feels really good, especially in VR. So many of these teams uh, were able to sort of come up with decisions from the very beginning that all served, again, the purpose of presence. So when it comes to things like UI, when it comes to things like menus, when it comes to things like health, when it comes to things like you know, conveying information to the player, usually the, the, the golden rule, I would say, is never on the face, never headlock, unless it's, it's part of the world. Find a, find a place in the real world for it. Find some smart gesture that you can use. I, think, I, I say badass a lot because I feel like when you make people feel badass with whatever gesture you have them doing in VR, it elevates what you've created from cool to magical. And people might forget like something that they did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So I think that thinking about those things, what you want players to feel, what it is, what you want them to embody in VR, what, you, what character you want them to become, and, how, and taking that into consideration from the very beginning will help you create something that's deep, that's meaningful, and that people want to come back to. And in that sense, that would be my answer to the question of what should I build? You should build something that you feel will be able to, you'll be able to deliver on, on those things that I mentioned, and above all, will give players a very deep sense of presence. So, of course, you know I'm going to ask about audio. <laughs> what uh, are some of the best audio experiences that you've had in VR, whether it be a musical game or a game that made good use of music and sound? Well, I would have to say one that you all might have heard of, maybe, is called Beat Saber. Yes. So, it's a, it's a small team of three. 
Two of them are uh, in Czech Republic and the other one is in LA. They, from the very beginning, had a composer uh, that they worked with, who's one of the three members. Because from the very beginning, they realized that audio was going to be the most important thing in their title. And they wanted to deliver that sense of feeling badass and feeling like you were part of something magical. And they knew that it would, it would be down to how good it felt of, of the, how good the audio played into the actual swinging mechanic. So they actually put a lot of work into having that be done first and then hand curated and created these beat maps that ended up, you know, and, and they, took a, they took a lot of uh, effort into making sure that each one of the different, and, and, I, and you saw that they were able to deliver different modes. So, you know, you've got your normal, you've got your expert. Um, so they did a really good job of taking that into account from the very beginning, and it paid off. Uh, beat Saber. Small team of three. Uh, and you guys would be surprised. There, there is a huge amount of successful titles that are all very small teams. Uh, some of them are students. Some of them are making their first thing in VR. But they have a clear vision. Like this team, Beat Saber, was their first thing in VR ever. They chipped games together before, but it was their first VR thing. But they had a very clear vision of how they wanted to make players feel and what they wanted to take away. Yeah. Hello. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just thinking about something you said about Orbis VR, which is that um, you failed to cast a spell um, viable to with the gesture. Um, and previously you played games where you had them bound to hotkeys. Um, now, what do you think about the longevity of any kind of game that replaces something convenient with something more difficult, uh, even if it may be a very sort of novel experience? I, I think it depends on the platform. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think that when it comes to VR, the expectation of the player is to sort of take it to a different level. So I think they come in wanting to be challenged. And I, I can't think of anything cooler to, to do as a healer than to actually have to cast a spell myself. That's how I always envisioned it when I first heard about VR a couple years ago. Uh, so what I would say is that it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Like... You know, for, for example, they have warriors in the game, so you actually have to be swinging away and doing combos. So that can get a little tiring maybe once you, if you do it 50 hours or six or seven hours a day, which is, which is what some of these folks are doing. So the, it's, I would say it's something to keep, keep track of. Like the, those, those devs are super responsive to their community. So what they've done is they've opened up forums uh, and they've made themselves very accessible. Uh, to that kind of feedback, because they've heard a little bit about that with the warrior itself. So what I would say is uh, design for presence, like give players, like take it to another level, but at the same time be open to getting feedback from the community, uh, and players will appreciate that. I hope that answers a little Thank bit. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, you're supporting the, the developers. I mean, how much support did you give to any of those seven games that you're showing? And uh, how much uh, support can those guys can expect from you? Sure. Uh, so a lot of the support that my team can give and a lot of where I, I think the real value lies is in having conversations with you m while you're in development, um, even initial conversations. And that's for a couple reasons. First, we have an engineering team in-house that has first made games for a very long time and has shipped really awesome games that I'm sure you've all played. And second, they've actually helped ship a couple hundred VR titles. So they have a lot of expertise and they can help you maybe solve for a very specific problem or question that you may have. Uh, one other thing that I would say is, so for, for these titles, for example, many of them, we were in talks with the devs from like some at concept stage, some well into development, and some a few months out from launch. One other reason why, so, so I, what I would say is if you remember one thing is that with us, the more of a heads up you give us, the more we'll be able to help you. Because part of what our team does is we have direct channels internally to all of Oculus's teams. So that goes all the way from comms to marketing to the store team to the engineering team to the future feature roadmap team who's always open for feedback to the team who's out there creating and designing for our next devices, including Santa Cruz. So reach out to us beforehand, and we'll be able to unlock. So many of those things that I just mentioned, like marketing, featuring, 
uh, being able to sort of help and support you for your launch will be will be possible if you reach out to us beforehand. Because if it's like the day before, it's it's harder. But if it's like a month or two out, we can do much more. Cool. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit um, about the differences between the Go and the Rift, not necessarily the sort of uh, obvious things, but more creatively what it could mean to the developers here. Between Go and Rift? Sure. Uh, what I would say is... Um, it, it, what will help you decide what platform it works better on will be down a lot to whether two hands or one hand are the must for your title. We've had Go titles that have worked really well because, so to answer your question, what I would say is you want to ship on the device that plays to the strengths of that platform. So if you ship a, a title where the magic is in having two hands into a one-handed uh, into a one-handed platform, it will be uh, it might be a fraction of what it could have been. Now that being said, today we actually have titles that have successfully launched the same title on both platforms, and in their case, what they were able to do was to sort of make the three DOF implementation feel as satisfying in a way as the six DOF. Another thing I would say is definitely um, having conversation, you know, come and talk to us because we can also help you. It, it can be hard a little bit to say without understanding what it is that you'd like to create, but that's, and that's one of the questions that we would probably ask you is, what does success look like for you? What are your goals? And where would you like to go? And based on that, then we can help you and give you more of a, a more of a, a, an answer that would be closer to, like in, in our case, we try not to give like generic or uh, it, it can be hard to uh, to help you the best if we don't understand what it is exactly that you need. Uh, but what I would say is that each platform has its own strengths, um, and and very soon we're going to have the in between with Santa Cruz coming up. But please come after. I'd love to talk some more. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, we're done for today. Thank uh, you, everybody. Thanks for your questions.